the train would come in from Burton on Trent, uh, just into the platforms up to our, our left up here, and the archways that we can see in the building were designed specifically to accommodate hogsheads of Indy Parallel. The pillars that we're standing next to, the width between the pillars is the width of, I think, about five or six hogsheads of Indy Parallel. You're using the word hogshead? What's that? A hogshead is a, a size of a barrel, a wooden barrel, which would be about, uh, I guess, three and a half feet high. Uh, you see them occasionally used in old pubs these days as tables and uh, it would go from here down to the docks. Can you tell us where we are and why that's got anything to do with what we're talking about today? Yeah, so this is St Pancras Station, one of the big main uh, train stations into London. And this station, which is a beautiful old red brick building with a magnificent hotel at the front, was built specifically to store barrels of Indy Pale Ale. So this entire floor of the station, which is now the Eurostar Terminal, was a storeroom for Indy Pale Ale. That shows you how huge it, a business it was. Yeah, so if you happen to pass through the Eurostar terminal at St Pancras Station in London, which is not far away from Platform 9 and 3 quarters, just imagine those sweeping red brick arches rammed full of enormous barrels of beer. That was Pete Brown, by the way, a food and drink writer we'll hear from throughout today's episode. I'm Rachel Stewart, and this is Don't Drink the Milk, the podcast that takes you on sometimes perilous journeys around the world, to better understand the things around us, like the beer we drink. IPA is one of the most famous styles of craft beer, especially it seems in the States, where it accounted for more than 40% of all craft beer sales in 2022. But it's got plenty of fans elsewhere in the world too, including among my fellow thirsty Brits. Uh, yeah, I've just drank an IPA there, yeah. I'm a fan of IPA. I do like IPAs, yeah. It's probably my most bought beer. Yeah, I feel the same. I feel <laughs> like when we buy each other a drink, we'll go, oh, what do you fancy? And we go, oh, just get me an IPA. But within those trendy, hoppy notes is a story of empire, exploitation and evolution. It's a story that's hiding in plain sight, right there in the name. India Pale Ale. Most people who drink it aren't aware that IPA stands for India Pale Ale. Uh, and when you go to non-English speaking countries, craft beer drinkers pronounce it IPA. They just think it's a word. Back to those beer drinkers in London. Do they know what IPA stands for? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, to which the answer I don't know. <laughs> I love beer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Indian. Indian Pale Ale. India. Oh, it's an, an Indian pale ale, I think it is, yeah. OK, but did they know why it's called India Pale Ale? No, I've no clue. Absolutely not. <laughs> I think so. It's because they used to transport beer from India to England. That's close-ish, but the wrong way round. This beer travelled from England to India back in colonial times. But how? Why? And what does this colonial hangover really mean for beer lovers around the world? The real story of empire does not tally with the mythology that is most often disseminated in the British public sphere. And it's a brutal, horrible, savage story, which has almost been erased from British history. We should be in a situation where we're telling people the history of the IPA and where it came from. Chinese whispers. Telephone sense of fear. Telephone. Kulak dan kulak. Telepost. He's watching the telephone. Telephone arabic. Oh, telephone. Russian scam. Don't drink the milk. When our producer Sam came to me with an idea for an episode about beer, I was like, yes, no questions, I'm in. Easiest pitch I ever made. <laughs> but to be fair, we've got a beer with real history here. I've been to a few beer tastings over the years where you often get this creation story of IPA. The back in the times of the British Empire, sailors and Brits living in India missed their beloved English ale because it couldn't survive that long journey halfway around the world without going bad. Until one smart brewer threw in some extra hops and cranked up the alcohol content to help it survive that long journey to India finally arriving in a drinkable state. Thus, IPA was born. Well, that's the legend anyway. But that's not how it really went down. Mm, not exactly. Now, it's true that hops, which are these little green flowers used in the brewing process, they do help preserve beer. But it wasn't like this eureka moment. People in England had already been brewing long-lasting beer for a while. Things like porters and what were known as October ales. 
And these stronger October ales were the foundation for what would eventually become India Pale Ale. And one guy started sending this strong, heavily hopped October ale. And when his beer got there, it sold better than everybody else's beer. He was working with the East India Company, the main British trading company operating in Asia. But the brewery got a little too greedy. The East India Company decided to ditch them and get their beer elsewhere. They went to a brewery in Burton-on-Trent. His beer hit India, and it was like nothing else before. Put the other guy out of business completely. They'd struck beer gold in Burton-on-Trent. Apparently, the minerals in the water of the Trent River Basin make delicious beer. Even today, if you're making a good IPA, you'll treat your water using a process known as Burtonization, which adds these minerals in. Mmm. Okay, but how does this delicious beer make its way all the way from Burton-on-Trent to India? Yeah, so we're now just behind King's Cross and St Pancras stations on the banks of Regent's Canal. And before railway existed, this canal was part of the network that brought India Pale Ale down to London and the docks. Now, Pete knows a thing or two about the long voyage this beer would then make from here to India. Because, well, he's done it. Yep, and with a barrel of beer in tow. The legend was that that journey aged the beer in a unique way. And so I thought, how does anyone know this? No one's done that journey since the Suez Canal opened in 1869. We need to get a barrel of beer on that journey again and see if it's true. And (laughs) for some reason, I decided I was the guy to do it. Grab your life jackets. We're going aboard. So we start off either in Liverpool or London on a big East Indiaman, which is a kind of big ship that's kind of half battleship, half cargo ship. Lots of cannons, lots of deep storage decks. And the beer was traditionally placed on the lower decks and used as ballast. Initially, that was the first reason it went to India before people realised how great it was. Uh, So you have these wooden sailing ships, you come out of the English Channel, you go out through the Canaries, the Azores. That can be quite stormy, especially around the Bay of Biscay, depending on what time of year it is. A significant proportion of ships were kind of wrecked and their cargoes would go into the shore. Then when you get to the equator, you're sailing kind of south, southwest, because Brazil is not as far away as it's portrayed on a lot of maps. If you sail just off south, once you get past the Horn of Africa, uh, you end up on the coast of Brazil. But when you get to the equator, and this happened to us, uh, you get to the doldrums. Uh, which is a common term now, but initially means the weather conditions around the equator where the sea is flat like a mirror and there's no wind at all. You're just a ship on a sheet of glass and you're stationary. And people often went mad there, jumped overboard. You know, you sail 24 hours a day on different watches. There were nights when I'd be on the tiller of the ship, sort of navigating, guiding it, where you've got shooting stars all above you flying fish in the water, jumping onto the deck, and phosphorescence in the water behind you. So it's like you're in your own silent disco. And then as you're going up the west coast of Africa, you go past Madagascar, you go past the coast of Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia. When you get to Somalia, you have a permanent night watch stationed in case of pirates who are real and now have speedboats and machine guns, not cutlasses and eye patches. And were you just sort of hugging your barrel of beer? <laughs> yeah, I had a, I had a big uh, suitcase on wheels uh, that it was in. <laughs> I got to India and I had to pay 276 American dollars in bribes to get out of the port. So uh, presumably when you got there, you cracked open the barrel and had a yeah. taste? Yeah, it was great. I mean, I'm biased, obviously, mm. uh, because I'd been waiting to taste this beer for three months. It was wonderful, it was mellow and it was smooth. So it kind of demonstrated that the journey had had a real effect on the taste of the beer. Brewers would market their beer with descriptions like Pale ale, prepared for the East and West India climate. Over time, that was obviously shortened to something a little easier to say. India Pale Ale. Would you like to order anything, like a pint or...? I think we'll go for IPA for sure. What have you got on tap? So we've got a couple of options. We've got the Sorcery 3.9% uh, IPA, and we also have a Live IPA, which is 5.5. Or you could go for a 2.8% small beer. We'll go in the middle. <laughs> yeah, we are working after all. We're in The Glad, a cosy pub not far from London's famous Borough Market. We can't not have an IPA while making an episode about IPA. <laughs> that, and we're here to meet someone else who is partial to a pint. Hey, David. Hi. You're right, David. Long time no see. Yes. Yes. Yeah, you will. Yeah. My name's Dave Jess Darson. I was actually acclaimed as Beer Writer of the Year 
2023, a few days ago. Uh, I'm a journalist and a British Asian author. My mum is Malaysian and my dad is Singaporean, but he's from Indian descent. And um, I love beer, but primarily I love pubs and how it's served and the culture surrounding beer and those who drink it. Then um, first of all, I should say cheers. Thanks for coming cheers. to Cheers, no worries. Cheers. Thanks for asking. What can you tell us when you taste this beer? Like, what should we be looking out for in the flavour? Well, I mean, what we're having now is an American-style IPA. Mm. The majority of craft beers are going to be IPAs that are brewed in the American style. Mm. So they have more uh, citrusy hops, whereas a British IPA is always going to be more malty or bitter like when you have an american ipa they do are generally higher abv you know percentage alcohol wise whereas british ipas are going to be more sessionable so session is any um, beer that's around four percent i'd say and anything why is it called that? so you can have a session <laughs> so you can have like four beers or you know you can drink it over a longer period of time than you wow. would for another beer yeah it's okay, literally on the nose as that, yeah. <laughs> okay, we're on a session today. Um, how do today's IPAs compare in flavour to what would have been shipped off back then? It wouldn't have tasted anything like an IPA that we have today. Oh, right. Um, so, beers that were shipped to India, so they completely changed their flavour profiles by the time they reached India. We perhaps would find it very unpalatable. <laughs> the hop character probably would have disappeared and it would be more mellow and more like sort of champagne at the time. But the problem with that is it wasn't very luxurious for the people who were living under colonial rule at the time, particularly because of the atrocities that were being committed by the East India Company and then later on the Raj. It's a misty morning in London. You've taken me down to the water. Uh, we're somewhere around Canary Wharf. Mm -hmm. Looking out onto the slightly dirty looking Thames. <laughs> Lots of seagulls around, but apart from that, not really a person to be seen. Yeah, we've got some shipping containers in the background being mm. loaded up and down. So this is the spot where the East India Company ships would have come in to load it up with goods for Brits in India things like India Pale Ale, foods, furniture, whatever commodities from home they wanted. And it's also the spot where those ships would have eventually come back after their very long voyage, carrying lots of things from India. Spices, tea, mm. textiles. And, you know, it's funny, we've got the city right behind us. So these tall skyscrapers, lots of them are large international banks, kind of a symbol of the wealth that flowed into this country due to what the British Empire brought back. So I think the important thing to recognize about the East India Company uh, is that when it was set up in 1600, um, England, Britain at the time was a very marginal part of the global economy. The Indian economy was worth 10 times that of Britain. So that's 1600. But if you look at 1870, the share of global GDP has gone from just under 2% for Britain to 9%, so four times. India, however, has gone from 22% of GDP to 12%, so almost half. And obviously, India is a much bigger place, huge population. Uh, and at that time, the English economy, the British society was much poorer than South Asia. And that is really the impact of the East India Company and subsequent British imperial policy. Wow. So while this company was around, Britain's economy quadruples and India's is halved. Yep. A pretty drastic movement of wealth. And this is why the tale you get at beer tastings, it's only one tiny piece of a much bigger, more complicated story. It's not just about how the beer is made, but Why? Yeah, like, let's not talk about this elephant in the room. Why are the British people over there in the first place craving their beer so far from home? Right? So I spoke to Nick Robbins, who you just heard. He's a historian and professor at the London School of Economics. Now, we've heard the name the East India Company a few times already, and it was one of the first ever multinational corporations. So if you, if you imagine, I suppose, a combination of Exxon and Walmart and Google, the biggest corporations in the world, all as one, with a private army, running a state, what do you think is going to happen? The consequences are not going to be pretty. 
Oh my god, that sounds terrifying. Indeed. I was a bit confused about how this company operated, but that's because it evolved over nearly 300 years. So the East India Company was a shareholder-owned company, so it was licensed by the Crown to particularly get access to the luxury goods of Asia. And its first task was to get access to the spice trade. And then textiles and garments became the core business of the company for a hundred or so years. So it was trying to use these precious, scarce uh, commodities, gold and silver, to buy the spices, then the textiles. Because there was simply at that stage, nothing really that uh, England and the UK was producing, because it's before the Industrial Revolution, which it could really sort of trade and were useful in those continents and climates. But after a while, things escalated. It ceased really just being a trading company with its uh, trading outposts in different cities and actually used its private army to get involved in local wars and therefore starting to take over and rule certain parts of India, largely on a sort of nominal basis, so there would still be local rulers but the East India Company would be the power behind the throne. That power meant they took over government functions like raising taxes. So they're taxing Indians and then using that money to buy Indian products, which are shipped back to Britain. So this was, in a sense, the, the drain of India was reflected in the stock market boom of the East India Company after this, because actually the company's shares were seen basically as a license to print money based on the tax revenues of India. So that's the first way through essentially conquest and therefore control of the tax revenues, definitely mechanisms which were in a sense consciously used so that Britain didn't pay its way in the world. The British weren't just using economic oppression though. They used military might and violence to shut down resistance and conquer territory. They had a huge, huge army. At one time, their army outsized the British army. And the early 19th century was kind of like Britain's version of the Wild West in India. It was plunder, it was pillage, it was people setting themselves up as very rich people. And it was quite riotous and quite lawless. One of the things is the lives of the British people in India were generally very short. It was a very dangerous place to be, largely through disease. Being part of the East India Company was a very high-risk venture, but potential for very high personal gain. And it invested nothing in the country. So we had famine after famine after famine, war after war after war. Part of the story that often gets lost is the resistance against the East India Company. First of all, some people back in Britain were protesting. So because of its scandals, because of its booms and busts, because of its oppressions around the world, it was a subject of plays. It was a subject of a lot of caricatures. Weavers in London actually sort of marched on Parliament to oppose the company's practices. Others around the world were protesting too, like soon-to-be Americans. The Boston Tea Party, again, was a protest against the East India Company. And the American patriots who were protesting against this actually said, fellow countrymen, uh, look what the East India Company has done in India. We better watch out that they don't do the same here. And of course, in India, there was resistance too, led by figures like Tipu Sultan, known as the Tiger of Mysore. His possessions were worth about £200 million in today's money. And so he was a, a scientist, a scholar. When he was murdered by the British, they smashed his throne up and cut up all the jewels. And when he was defeated, Lord Wellesley held up a, a glass and toasted to the corpse of India. And in a weird way, this brings us back to beer. It was literally fueling an army. Being a soldier in India was short periods of intense violence, followed by long periods of doing absolutely nothing. And one of the things they did to pass the time was get drunk. There was a local drink called Arak, and if you drank Arak, you probably had a life expectancy as a British soldier of about three months. Alcoholism and disease killed far more British soldiers than anything else did that ever died in battle. And so the British Army knew that they had to offer an alternative that was strong in alcohol, that the troops could get drunk on, that was good enough quality to stop them drinking the Arak. 
and that's when IPA started being shipped in industrial quantities. More beer in a second, I promise, but very quickly. It's here we come to the demise of the East India Company. This chaotic situation couldn't last, and under pressure from home and abroad, the British government finally steps in. In the 1850s, you had increasing control by the British state, one, to rein in the company, actually, because it was in many senses out of control in India and was concerned about it being out of control in Britain as well, but also so that the British state could start exercising more control of this commercial institution as it was becoming more of a sort of territorial power and not just a merchant uh, operation. And the British Raj essentially took over in 1858. The end of the East India Company didn't bring an end to colonial rule. Far from it. The British Raj marked a period of direct rule by the British government over the Indian subcontinent. That lasted until the partition and independence of India and Pakistan in 1947. As with the East India Company, the end of the 19th century saw IPA fade away too. And this was for a few reasons. Not least of all, attitudes towards drinking. In the later Victorian age, Britain became a very prim, proper, uh, almost a religious fundamentalist country. And those prim Victorians and the missionaries who went to India were often in favor of prohibition. Shipping routes were also shortened when the Suez Canal opened in 1869, cutting the journey to India down from six months to a matter of weeks. So no need for a beer with such a long shelf life. And finally, there were some new beers on the block. Germany and the Czech Republic developed golden Pilsner lagers, and they were even better at being cold, refreshing drinks in a very hot climate. There is nothing better than having a lager in the sun. But that clearly wasn't the end of IPA. I mean, today it seems to be absolutely everywhere. So when did it make a comeback? This style pops up sort of like a message in a bottle in the US in the 1970s. While experimenting and trying to recreate the flavor of old, mellow British beers, brewers on the West Coast discovered their own hops had a very different effect. Wow, that's punchy. That's... That's different, that's rejuvenating. And so American Bruce accidentally stumbled across a way of using their hops, which no one else wanted, Mm. to create a beer like no one else had tasted before. And it became the style that sort of exploded craft beer as a movement from kind of American microbrewing to being a global multi-billion pound business. It's kind of like how Fanta apparently tastes different all over the world because of the different oranges, right? Yeah, something like that. (laughs) Anyway, there's one place in the U.S. where IPA had a great leap forward, thanks to some hoppy innovations. We sent reporter Melanie Brown to Hoplandia, or Beervana, a.k.a. Oregon. The last one smelled like pickles. Really? Pickles? Yeah. I got pickles. You got dill? I got some dill. Interesting. Yeah. This state in the northwestern U.S. on the Pacific coast above California boasts one of the highest densities of breweries. But I've come here to join some student hop pickers who are currently rubbing between their palms the fluffy, sticky and really very pungent hop cones and noting down what aromas they can smell. These are the ones that I thought smelled pretty good. So what notes are you getting? It's like floral, oh, like rosy, smell. kind of like really juicy. It smells good, it's really delicate. Yeah. What's the weirdest description you've ever given something? Soy sauce. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Welcome to Oregon State University's experimental hop breeding fields, where they've been doing research on hops since 1893. Lead scientist Sean Townsend offers to take me out for a little tour of the hop crop. Try saying that after a few too many. So we're standing in the middle of, of some fields, and in front of us, it's sort of mini telegraph poles Mm. with wires linking them up in a sort of crisscross fashion, 20 feet or so above our head. And essentially they're growing like vines, it looks like. Yeah, vines. So in the spring, all of this growth starts and then it all happens within the one growing season. Gosh, so they've climbed this high, 20 20 foot, just Uh over the summer. Yeah, Yeah, they'll they'll grow up to a foot a day in the best conditions. That sounds a bit monstrous. They are. What's fun, this time of the year is all of the different smells. 
Sean's just handed me a, a, a bud, I guess you would call this, uh, or uh, what is it? A we call flower? it informally a cone. It's the mature female flower. It's a very strong smell. Mm -hmm. That's it's actually a very nice smell. Yeah, that one's unusual. Sort of peppery, lemony, almost like there's a bit of cannabis in there or something. Yeah, it's possible. That is, that is strong. Compare that to that one. Ooh, oh, that's totally, that's, that's very different. Right. That's kind of funky and... Uh, almost cheesy. That yeah. is cheesy. Now this is fresh, right? They've not been dried yet. Right. And so that aroma can change as they dry. But, okay. uh, but we get the notes uh, as they come off of the plant. So we don't have to worry about a cheesy pint. But it was really notable how many of the scents I was picking up off the fresh hop flower are really very similar to the flavours you taste when drinking an IPA. So what makes for a good IPA hop? So like the standard West Coast IPA, you often see, in my mind, kind of the piney, resiny type hops that go into those. Some fruit as well, fruity notes. And if you're talking about more of the East Coast style, the hazy style, then certainly that tends to gravitate towards the more grapefruit, citrusy, guava, those kinds of fruits. So I don't focus too much on any specific thing. I just try to bring something new to the marketplace. In addition to flavour, Sean is particularly focused on making sure the new hop breeds he develops are robust enough to resist pests and diseases. That means constantly evaluating the crop all the way from seed to field over many seasons. Uh, the process, on average, is about 10 years. So the, the hops I'm looking at growing up that mini trellis, that in theory could be in someone's drink in a decade. Correct. That's exciting, isn't yeah. it? To think that you've got the next flavours yeah. oh, growing yeah. over there yeah. and we don't know what they are yet. Right. Sean explains that Oregon is a hop-growing powerhouse thanks to its climate, long days and fewer disease and insect problems than elsewhere in the country. That will change as climate change gathers pace. So Sean is already planning for the future. Oh, absolutely, yeah. The federal government is predicting that this part of the country will be warmer and drier in 30 years. So I started looking at drought tolerance in the hops, and we do that on the short trellis by simply just skipping a couple of days of water, stressing the plants, and see who does pretty well with that and who doesn't. And then we can use that in a breeding scheme to try to improve on that trait. We have an eye on the future trying to future-proof our hops as best we can. So whilst the world is burning around us, at least we'll be able to toast our demise with a crisp and juicy IPA. The craft brewing scene in the Pacific Northwest is thriving. Portland in particular boasts many breweries and places to enjoy said brews. So I'm off to a brewery cum bar to see the end result of these hop-growing efforts. Hello. Hi. How are you? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, thanks for coming in. Whitney Burnside is the co-owner and brewmaster of Grand Fur Brewing in Portland. She describes her IPAs as dry, assertive and unapologetically bitter. So how does she pick the right hops for the flavour she wants to create? We will usually just test one out. Uh, you know, maybe we'll brew a 15 barrel batch of it. That's our size of our brew house. And if we really like it, then we'll start to think about, did it do well in that style of beer? Would it be more suited for higher alcohol, lower alcohol, different style? And we'll, we'll go from there. And how quickly can you go from sort of receiving a bag of exciting new hops or existing hops to having it in a pint glass? For an IPA, from brewing to getting served a glass, 17 days. Gosh, that's actually a lot quicker than I, I would have thought. Yeah. yeah. It's finally time for a taste test. I leave the giant vats of beer and go upstairs to a trendy metal and glass bar that overlooks the brewing floor. I would love to pour you a couple of samples. Great, I would um, love to receive those. The first sample I'm going to pour you is um, our Lichen IPA. Right. This is kind of a San Diego style West Coast IPA so it's very, very light and drinkable. Smell the aroma coming off that. Mmm. So it's very sweet smelling mm -hmm. in a lovely way. Like and that kind ripe of... fruit. You get a little strawberry, you get a little of that uh, ruby red grapefruit. Okay, I'm gonna try a little Cheers. sip. Cheers. 
Oh, that's really refreshing though. Thank it you. smells sweeter than it tastes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. It's very smooth, delicious. A very gentle tang, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but not overwhelming at yeah. all. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at the liking can. Yes. It looks pretty funky. Yes. Uh, our artist, her name is Corinne McNeely. Is that expected now? That your your newest beer or IPA or whatever, <laughs> that it comes with some sort of attractive visual exactly. element. Exactly, yeah. We're big on that. Painting a picture of of the experience that matches the name. I'm so thirsty now. Well, luckily for us, it's time for our next beer, I think, Rachel. Yes. I also want to apologize at this point because I had no idea what the US had done for services to beer. On behalf of my country, I accept your apology. <laughs> I promise I will never make a joke about bad American beer again, but I still refuse to drink my beer out of a metal bottle. How about a can? Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Rachel, I have a few IPAs from the US here that we can sample, but more importantly, I want you to take a look at the branding and tell me what you see. Ah, okay. Um, so we've got some really bright colours. <laughs> okay, I said we've got some bright colours and the name of the beer is... Bright colours. <laughs> Uh, we've got kind of like a tie-dye design on the front with like pinks and turquoises and blues. Next one is also bright colours, but in a kind of cool, simple graphic way. So we've got very nice deep pink and oranges uh, and it's called Grapefruit Crush. I like this one a lot. I'm salivating. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, this one's cool. Right, so we've got a bit of a cartoon going on. We've got <laughs> a goat wearing underpants. He's got an electric guitar and he's raising a saxophone above his head. We've got a motorcycle being ridden by some masked, horned thing with purple hair. And a skier with really cool retro clothes. It's a lot to pack on one can. There's so much going on here. I'm not sure I would go for this on the shelf. It's mm. too much for me. <laughs> <laughs> it drew me in. I mean, looking at all of these as a whole, mm. what sorts of vibes are you getting? There's loads of bright colours. It's quite fun. Funky, young. There's some like humor involved, I'd say. It's quite funny. It's quirky. Yes, there are some clear themes here. But in recent years, marketing for some IPAs, particularly IPAs in the UK, has gone down a completely different route, recalling the era of earlier IPAs. Mm. Here, so I want you to have a look at some of these. Okay, so we've got one first up called Sea Tiger. Then next up, Jaipur IPA. Um, oh, again, this one's pretty in your face. Imperial IPA. Old Empire IPA. Bengal Lancer. But underneath it says brewed beside the Thames. Ooh, okay, the next one is called Maharaja IPA. Okay, this bottle again looks pretty old school. It's called 1839. Okay, this is like really trying to hark back to olden times. So these are some bottles and the labels on them and how they're marketed. But here are a couple advertising campaigns that have also run in the UK in recent years. So the third poster I can see it says, brewed in Bermondsey, South London, nowhere near India. It's almost like you're being taunted as a brown drinker by these marketing, the way these products are marketed. And I think it harks back to this idea of Britain being once great. And when people think about that, they always think about empire and how Britain ruled India. Especially when you have a situation where we're, we're a declining force on the world stage. So to hark back to an era where we weren't that, then it is very compelling for some people and some drinkers. But for me, I think that's really silly because all that we're harking back to an era that never existed anyway. A lot of people were very poor in this country and a lot of people were made a lot poorer in India. This is actually what got David writing about India Pale Ale in the first place. Marketing companies aren't interested in history. They're not interested in anything apart from selling a product. The problem is, is when it becomes marketed as a luxurious product that ties into colonial splendor, or it does something silly and doesn't engage with its past, you have this thing of a beer company saying, well, I don't want to engage in that subject because it's um, too problematic. And what about consumers? Are we ready to talk about this colonial legacy? In that trendy craft beer bar in London, we surprised people with a pretty unexpected question while they sipped on their pints. Do you think Britain deals with its colonial past well? Ha <laughs> uh, ha, no. absolutely not. 
not not in terms of education, not in terms of what they're doing now or to recognise it. No, absolutely not. As a whole, the country is divided. There's a section of people who are like, you know, bring back the empire, who probably don't know the history behind and the violence that came from it. It's very celebrated, which I think ignores a lot of what happened. I, yeah, it makes me uncomfortable to think of the fact that Britain is very proud of it still. Based on history, and especially what's going on lately with uh, obviously a new king and all these things, I think they had a chance to actually change that legacy. They didn't. So yeah, I would say no. I lived in the UK for a while, and I've got to say, this really shocked me. This period between the Tudors and World War I, a pretty large period of time, seems to be like this black hole for most Brits. Mm, I know, it, it really is kind of shameful. I don't even remember learning a single thing about the East India Company in school. And I actually only had to do history as a subject until I was like 14, I think. For a people so into pub quizzes, you'd think you guys would be more schooled in your own history. <laughs> But Rachel, you're not the only one who missed out on this chapter. So my students come to the classroom in their third year. They're about to finish. And in general, they have a very, very minimal understanding of the British Empire in general. Almost no knowledge of the East India Company. And very basic, if any, knowledge about the British Raj in India. They might have seen a few films or read a book or two, uh, but there's very little specific knowledge on these topics. My name is Priyamvada Gopal, and I'm Professor of Postcolonial Studies at the University of Cambridge. Priya teaches at one of the most prestigious universities in the UK, if not the world. But she's found herself having to offer a sort of remedial crash course in colonial history, just so that her students have a basic understanding of the British Empire. But Priya is a professor of literature, not history. I believe that you can't really teach literature without some historical understanding. And I also believe that literature is a participant in the writing of history, in documenting how people relate to historical events, how people relate to each other, how people think about themselves in the world. We often get the story of empire from the point of view of the colonizer, in this case the British, but from other European countries as well. But how do you teach this history of empire? Kind of from what vantage points do you approach it? One of the great virtues of being able to teach via literature is that it allows us multiple viewpoints. We look at texts written by, for instance, men and women, uh, who were part of the British Raj. We look at British administrators in parts of Africa and in India. We look at the point of view of the enslaved. We look also at things like caste, class and race. And we also try not to just look at a kind of binary of colonizer, oppressor and colonized victim. We think about the nature of collaboration in the entrenching of the British Empire and who within the colonies benefited to some or a greater extent from the project of empire. Why do you think this large era in British history gets skipped over in the UK? It requires a kind of demanding relationship with history. There was enslavement, there was indenture, there was land grabbing, there were famines, massacres. A lot of it is not very pretty and it doesn't really tally with the idea of a glorious nation that led the world towards betterment. So I think what, what, it, what it would require is a dealing with difficulty. And that's something that the British educational system, not unlike other educational systems, is reluctant to do. What are your students' reactions to learning this history of empire? The main feedback I got uh, was a demand for more. Young people, you know, have both the energy and the capacity and the interest in dealing with toughness. Now, my students, you know, are not very young, but they are 18 to 20. They are very keen to grapple with toughness. They want and relish the challenge of difficulty. I think the unwillingness to deal with toughness really reflects a jaded adult mindset, an adult mindset that isn't willing 
to leave its comfort zone. And as Priya points out, this is not ancient history. Over one third of the world lives in a country that was once under British rule. There is very little that is happening in the world at this exact moment that is not profoundly tied up to European empires more broadly, but also the British Empire more specifically. And one of the exercises that my students really enjoy doing in dialogue with each other is thinking about how the British Empire shaped their own family histories, their own class backgrounds, their own kind of cultural identities. And then how do I, an Indian woman, turn up in the classroom teaching English literature? And then we talk about the fact that the British Empire created what it called a class of interpreters between us and the millions whom we govern. And they turned to the dominant castes in India to create the small group of English speaking people who would be, as they put it, interpreters, English in every way, but blood and color. And I talk about the fact that my ancestors were part of that project and therefore were part of the creation of a small but extremely influential Anglophone, English-speaking middle class in India. We often think about, you know, historical acts as very distant. But actually, when we start to make the connections, we might realize that we're a lot closer to certain historical events and moments than we think we are. Yeah, it gives us kind of a tether, a connection in a way that just learning about it in a classroom feels maybe too big or not so tangible. Yeah, or, or pointless. But, you know, mm. here you can start to make connections that, you know, may give you some sense of who you are. So my name is Ishan Puri and uh, I'm the founder of White Rhino Brewing Company in India. So we're very much the Indian brewery that's slowly but surely putting India on the map, you know, by changing uh, stereotypes pertaining to Indian beers and breweries. So IPA was created long ago to satisfy a very specific demand half a world away. It was part of this violent period of colonial conquest. Then it slipped into obscurity for a while before getting a modern revamp in the US. And now it's come full circle back to India. Yeah, but with a very important difference. This time, the brewer is Indian. I wanted the brand to obviously have some element of India. A lot of people still associate the rhino with just Africa. But, you know, we also have rhinos in India. But then I also chose the white rhino because it's a symbol of rarity. And we are India's first craft brewery. And, you know, I, I wanted a name that would kind of distinguish us as, as something that's rare and hard to find. Hence white rhino. Ishan is trying to make a name for India in the global craft beer scene. But the first goal was to make beer for Indians. I went to college in the U.S. and it was very much all about West Coast IPAs, really hoppy, you know, bitter IPAs. But I, I didn't really feel that would work in India. You know, we've very much been a country of macro lager. Then having kind of established my first two styles, which were a wheat beer and a lager, then we said, OK, let's introduce the market to something a little more flavorsome. And that's where we came up with our own rendition of the IPA. It wasn't a West Coast or an East Coast or the original, you know, style supposedly pioneered by the British Empire. This was effectively, you know, a style which I designed for the Indian market. Because we don't overhop the beer, some of the malt character does actually come out. But I mean, the, the bottom line is it's a really balanced beer. And I feel that even beer novices can appreciate it. And when it comes to the history of IPA... Ishan thinks it's time to move on to a new chapter. I don't think anyone really cares much for the original story. I don't think that story has much mileage in India. Ultimately, people will drink what they can palate and they won't drink what they don't like. We're just trying to say that, look, Indian breweries are here and we make great beer and we shouldn't be looked at as a country that just produces cheap macro lagers. And that's it. And you know one place people have had the chance to enjoy a pint of white rhino? Back in The Glad, that little London pub where we met David. Not content with just writing about beer, David actually had a go at brewing his own IPA too. Instead of hiding the colonial history of the beer, he printed it right on the can. And there was a message in the flavour too. Coriander, fennel, jaggery, which is sugar, Amchor, turmeric, uh, there was mango puree, bergamot and lime zest. 
it even had a, like a, a hint of coconut and everything. It was a, yeah, it was a wonderful beer. It was a, very, a privilege to have that. Does that mean that we don't have to cancel IPA? Well, I don't believe in cancelling anything. It's a, a wonderful product. I mean, we were talking about like craft beers um, so popular because it's so different to what came before. In this country, we had four brewers brewing two or three different beer styles. And now we have so much choice. And I think that that's wonderful uh, for the consumer, but I think it's time that consumer engage with these products a little bit more. In fact, David thinks the pub is the perfect place to start having these conversations about the past. Absolutely, yeah. Beer is the drink of the people. So it's now it's a chance that it can teach people um, and give them more information and be more honest. It's our history. This is British history. We all need to know about it. And to see the empire for what it was and to see how we can move forward as a nation. Thanks for joining us for a pint, or three. And thanks to all of our interviewees for their time and expertise. This episode was produced by Sam Baker. It was edited by Charlie Shield. Our team also includes Katharina Abel on fact-checking, Julia Rosa in the archives, and Chris Kaula. Extra thanks this week to Shabnam Sarita and to Mega Khanna at the Gladstone Arms in London. I'm your host, Rachel Stewart. If you're new here and still wondering what's up with our weird quirky name, I recommend listening to our first ever episode. It's about the game Broken Telephone. You can get in touch with us at don'tdrinkthemilk at dw.com, no apostrophe. Tell us what historical conversations you're having over a beer, or just recommend your favourite brew. We'll be back in two weeks with something to soak up all of that beer. Mmm, that's really good. (laughs) I can taste the bright colours jumping out of the can. At the beginning of the 20th century, Germany controlled vast territories in Africa. Colonial rule was violent and still casts a shadow to this day. They imposed their identity. You know, they had that mentality of saying that we came to civilize you. And the German administrations from 1885 to 1906 was characterized by a genocide kind of administrations. The Germans made sure that they will kill heroes by other means. From Togo to Tanzania, Cameroon to Namibia, our Shadows of German Colonialism podcast discovers the destruction wrought by Germany's forgotten empire. When you talk to the people, it's when you really think, understand how people still remember the trauma they went through colonialism. Find us wherever you get your podcasts.